I want to talk to you tonight about an arcane discipline known as textual criticism. I'm sure it's everybody's favorite subject, but it's uh, really here's the question that we're going to ask. Can we trust the text? And what I mean by that is, can we trust that the New Testament that we hold in our hands today in all essential respects goes back to the apostles and their associates and what they wrote? Or is it something that is so far removed from the original, we can't possibly tell if it's accurate, if it's uh, added a bunch of more uh, things that were not there originally. Uh, it, it, it's something that we have to wrestle with. Let me illustrate how important it is to get some of these really minute details on these kinds of things right. There was a monk who was uh, the equivalent of a seminary student. His name was Brother Andrew back in the ninth century in England. And Andrew was studying at, uh, as I said, the equivalent of a seminary. They didn't call it back then uh, a seminary. But uh, when he got done with his uh, studies, uh, as was the normal case, uh, the graduates would get a letter of recommendation from the headmaster of the school, and then they would be sent out to go work at a monastery. And so this headmaster sent Andrew with his letter of recommendation, which was sealed, so Andrew didn't know what it said. And he got to a monastery and handed it to the abbot. The abbot opened the letter and uh, it said, this young man is very, very anal. Can I, can I say that here, is that okay? <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll, I'll be uh, uh, more gentle with you all. Uh, so, uh, and he said, uh, Andrew is a detailed person. He focuses on things. He's not particularly socially uh, uh, graceful, but uh, you would be wise to use him as a scribe, copying out texts very carefully. So the abbot decided, great, we need one. We haven't had a scribe here for some years. So he put him to work. And he said, we'd like to have our bylaws copied out, Andrew. So here, I'm going to put you in this room. You start copying out the bylaws. We haven't had uh, any of the bylaws copied for decades, and our, our copies are wearing out. So Andrew starts to work on it. About 45 minutes later, there's a knock on the abbot's door. He opens it. Andrew's there. Holy Father, there seem to be some discrepancies among these manuscripts. Have you got some older ones that I can compare, maybe uh, look at? And the abbot said, well, yes, we do. We've never allowed a monk on the first day or even the first year to look at those older manuscripts, but we'll, we'll let you do it. I understand you, you come um, well recommended for this kind of duty. So Andrew started copying out these older manuscripts. And again, about 45 minutes later, there's a knock on the abbot's door. Holy Father, there still seem to be some discrepancies. Do you have something older I can look at? And uh, the abbot thought, you know, we have the original bylaws that nobody has seen in hundreds of years. But I'm going to trust you to very, very carefully handle these manuscripts and just be extremely careful with them as you copy them out. So he takes them down a labyrinthian path to a subterranean library room and uh, puts them in behind a desk and says, okay, here they are. Here's these old manuscripts. Go ahead and start copying. About 20 minutes later, there were about 10 different sets of hands pounding on the abbot's door. And he opens the door, and it's all the rest of the monks who were there at the uh, monastery. And they said, Holy Father, this new monk has gone berserk. You've got to come down and see what's going on. And so they ran down to the, this, uh, this uh, serpentine path to get to this uh, little archive room. And Andrew is weeping on the desk, and he's pounding his fist. And he said, they left out the letter R. They left out the letter R. And the abbot thought, man, this guy really is anal. And... Andrew said, the word is supposed to be celebrate. <laughs> now, you guys got it first. <laughs> you were coming slowly behind them. Then the you guys were way, are you from Oklahoma back there by any chance? I mean, you're seated about as far back as Oklahoma is, so maybe so, I'm not sure. But anyway, that tells you how important this discipline is at times. Even individual letters are things that textual critics look over. So we're going to ask the question, can we trust the text? Here's a photograph of the oldest papyrus, the oldest manuscript of Paul's letters in the world. This is just one of 86 leaves. This is known as P46, and it's written in about A.D. 200. 
I'm going to show a photograph of a close-up of that a little bit later tonight. Okay, let me start by showing you what skeptics th say about the text of the New Testament. I'm going to start by quoting that uh, great scholar Dan Brown in his volume, The Da Vinci Code. The Bible, he says, has evolved through countless translations, additions, and revisions. History has never had a definitive version of the book. Well, we've all heard that kind of a thing. You've been to the local Starbucks or at the office or at the gym, and you hear people say, hasn't the Bible been translated and retranslated so many times we can't possibly get back to the original? Tonight, you're going to find out whether that is indeed the case. Let me kick this up a notch and quote from an atheist. This time it's C.J. Werleman, who he likes to write provocatively titled books like Jesus Lied, He Was Only Human, then debunking the New Testament. Werleman's first book was called God Hates You, Hate Him Back. Now, I think that's an ironic title for an atheist. <laughs> if he were honest, he would say, nothing hates you, hate nothing back, but that's not going to sell. Now, in this book, here's what Werleman has to say. We do not have any of the original manuscripts of the Bible. The originals are lost. We don't know when and we don't know by whom. What we have are copies of copies. In some instances, the copies we have are 20th generation copies. Well, it sounds like what he's saying is we don't have the first 19 generations. How can we possibly tell what the original text had to say? But it's not just novelists and atheists who are uh, singing in the chorus. It's Muslims as well, and sometimes very serious Muslims. And to our shame, many Muslim apologists know the Bible better than Christian apologists do. This is M.M. M. al Azmi, who's a, a very famous British Muslim apologist, and he wrote a book, The History of the Quranic Text from Revelation to Compilation, a comparative study with the Old and New Testaments. And here's what he has to say. The Orthodox Church, being the sect which eventually established supremacy over all the others, stood in fervent opposition to various ideas, also known as heresies, which were in circulation. These included adoptionism, the notion that Jesus was not God, but a man. Docetism, the opposite view, that he was God and not man. And separationism, that the divine and human elements of Jesus Christ were two separate beings. In each case, this sect, the one that would rise to become the Orthodox Church, and by that he doesn't mean the Greek Orthodox Church or the Eastern Orthodox Church, but what we would simply today call orthodoxy, deliberately corrupted the scriptures so as to reflect its own theological visions of Christ while demolishing that of all rival sects. If M. M. Alt Ozemi is right, what he is saying is that the New Testament originally may have had various views of Christ, they were hopelessly contradictory, but there was one group that finally beat out the others and they declared that Jesus was in fact God in the flesh but that probably was not part of the original text. Well, it's not just atheists and novelists and Muslims who are saying this. Their source is going to be biblical scholars, biblical scholars who are not Christian. And the most uh, important one today is a fellow by the name of Bart Ehrman. Now, let me tell you a little bit about Bart Ehrman. Uh, he is a Moody Bible Institute graduate and a Wheaton College graduate. He was an evangelical for many years. Bart and I are friends. I met him uh, 34 years ago at Princeton Seminary where he was working on his master's degree. And he was studying under the great Bruce Metzger who was probably the best New Testament textual critic of the 20th century and a very fine evangelical scholar. Ehrman got both his master's degree and his doctorate, his PhD under Metzger. And in the process, he began to change in his view, not only of the text, but of the Christian faith. Today, he considers himself to be an agnostic, but one who does not think that the God of the Bible even has a remote chance of being the real God. He calls him a Nazi-like deity. Well, Ehrman, in this book, Misquoting Jesus, the story, who ch uh, the story behind who changed the Bible and why, came out in 2005. And he got on to John Stewart's The Daily Show shortly after this. When he got on there, Stewart talked about this book, and it's, it's about all these textual variants, these differences among the manuscripts 
that end up being uh, marginal notes and differences in our translations today. And Stuart said, I congratulate you, sir. This is one hell of a book. Now, that's an interesting adjective to use for a book about Jesus, isn't it? But uh, that's nevertheless what Stuart said. Two days later, this book was number one on Amazon. Now, Ehrman didn't uh, pick the title Misquoting Jesus. He preferred the title uh, Lost in Transmission, but uh, his publisher said, no, that'll probably get placed in the transmission section or the automotive section of Barnes & Noble, you know, so we got to go with something like this. But it's interesting, he also didn't pick the cover because here we have Hebrew behind uh, probably Erasmus, and Hebrew is not what the New Testament is written in, and it's upside down as well. So Bart had nothing to do with the cover. But here's what he says. This is the first popular book on New Testament textual criticism. He says, not only do we not have the originals, we don't have the first copies of the originals. We don't even have copies of the copies of the originals or copies of the copies of the copies of the originals. That sounds like C.J. Werleman, doesn't it? But instead of 20 generations, Herman only takes it four generations. Now, towards the end of his book, he says, the more I studied the manuscript tradition of the New Testament, the more I realized just how radically the text had been altered over the years at the hands of the scribes. This sounds like M.M. M. al Azami. It would be wrong to say, as people sometimes do, that the changes in our text have no real bearing on what the text mean or on the theological conclusions that one draws from them. Both of these men, Werleman and uh, al Azami, got their material from Bart Ehrman's Misquoting Jesus. He is the number one religious skeptic in America today, and especially at Christmas time and Easter, he pops up on uh, various television channels. Okay, so those are some basic uh, positions of the skeptics. I don't share that attitude with him, and I'll share with you why tonight. But there's two attitudes that I want us to avoid as we launch into this discussion. The first is the attitude of radical skepticism, the idea that we can't possibly get back to the original text, we have no idea what it says, and that's the attitude that you see represented in these quotes that I put up to start with. But the other attitude is one that Christians sometimes fall prey to, and that is absolute certainty. Now, you especially get this among King James-only advocates. I've talked to some who are in Ohio and West Virginia, and they, one or two of these has actually said, in all seriousness, if the King James Bible was good enough for St. Paul, it's good enough for me. <laughs> A couple of these folks actually are from Fort Worth, I think. <laughs> and uh, so I have to pitch the conversation at that point to a level that they can understand and appreciate. So the next thing I said is, is well, how about them cowboys? You know, that's, that's where we can go. We can't talk on this level anymore. <laughs> but you all may have this temptation as well. You may have already succumbed to it. If the Bible you hold in your hands you think is in every single detail the Word of God, then you are holding to absolute certainty about what you are carrying to church. The problem is even that Bible has had changes. You use the New American Standard here and at first when it came out in the 1970s it, was, it had certain kinds of uh, text that it was based on and in the later edition of 1995, it changed the textual basis that was actually being translated. So the person who uses an older New American Standard can't say this is the Word of God in every single detail unless he's contradicting or she is contradicting the later person who's using the 95 and vice versa. We all succumb to this. It's a natural temptation, but I want to suggest to you we need to be somewhere between radical skepticism and absolute certainty as we wrestle with these issues. Okay, those are the two attitudes to avoid, and here, here's the four questions to answer. First of all, how many textual variants are there? What I mean by a textual variant, I'll define that in a minute, but differences in the wording among the manuscripts is really what it gets down to. What kinds of textual variations are there? What's the number of them? What's the nature of them? Then what theological beliefs depend on textually suspect passages? Wouldn't you like to know if the deity of Christ is dependent on textually suspect passages every time it's affirmed, or is it absolutely secure? That's kind of important for us to know, isn't it? Isn't it important to know if the deity of Christ was invented in the fourth century, or if we have any evidence before the age of Constantine when the deity of Christ may well have been taught in and seen in these manuscripts? What about the virgin birth, the resurrection of Christ, 
the bodily resurrection of Christ, the death of Christ on the cross, his atonement for our sins, the Trinity. It's important for us to know whether these things are in the original text or not. And so finally, has the essence of the Christian faith been corrupted by the scribes? Now, before we begin, I, I do a long preliminary uh, amount of material in my lectures, and so we'll probably go on for another 45, 50 days before I get into the text. But uh, here we go. Here's the preliminary question. Don't we have the original New Testament anymore? The answer to that is no, we don't. The original would have turned to dust hundreds of years ago, certainly by the end of the second century, before A.D. 200. And uh, I, there's ways we can tell if we actually had the original manuscripts. We would know it, I'm pretty sure, if we had those. But uh, we don't have anything that comes close to that. So we don't have these originals anymore. Well, okay, we don't have the originals, but you have all these copies, lots and lots of copies. If they all say the same thing, then our job is done. We might as well say that's the original or it's, it's as close as we can get. But the manuscripts disagree with each other. In fact, if you look at the two oldest manuscripts, uh, or two of the oldest manuscripts that agree with each other more than any other two for the first 800 years of the Christian era, these, have the, these two have the highest agreement with each other. For those of you who know a little bit of Greek, they are P75 and Codex B, as in boy. Those two manuscripts have a 94% agreement. But that means that they disagree with each other between six and 10 times per chapter. If you were to extrapolate that out of the whole New Testament, that's about 2,000 differences between the two closest manuscripts of the first eight centuries. So because of the disappearance of the originals, and because of the disagreements among the copies, we have to do what's called textual criticism. So another preliminary question, that is, what is a textual variant? And this is our last preliminary question, I promise you. It's any place among the manuscripts in which there's variation in wording, including word order, omission, or addition of words, even spelling differences. If it's a one-letter difference, like they left out the letter R, then that counts as a textual variant. And let me explain this to you as well, because there's been kind of an evangelical misunderstanding about what a textual variant is. A textual variant is not one place in the text where you have wording that you have, let's say you have 100 manuscripts that say Jesus, and 100 manuscripts that say the Lord instead of Jesus. John chapter 4 verse 1 is a great place where you actually have that, that textual variation. That doesn't mean we have 100 textual variants from Jesus because it's found in 100 manuscripts. We have one variant that's attested 100 times. That makes sense? Don't count textual variants by multiplying them by the number of manuscripts that have them. There has been since 1963 that uh, basic assumption of what a textual variant is among evangelicals, and it has found its way into quite a bit of apologetic literature. Okay, so we're talking about differences among the manuscripts and we count a variant only once, even if it's attested 100 times, 1,000 times, it doesn't matter. So the number of variants, let me begin with how many words there are in the Greek New Testament. There's approximately 140,000 words in the Greek New Testament. Or to be more precise, 138,162. But don't ask me how I know that. I, all I can tell you is I'm related to Brother Andrew. In terms of textual variants among these 140,000, the numbers are about 400,000. Now, that's a lot of variants. That's about two and a half variants for every word in the Greek New Testament. But about a year ago, almost a year and a half ago now, there was a student at Cambridge University who gave a lecture in San Diego that I attended, and he happened to be a former intern of mine getting his doctorate now at Cambridge. And he said, no, that 400,000 is incorrect. It's closer to 500,000. And the number may still go up. These are just estimates. We haven't looked at all the, the uh, differences among the manuscripts to tell. But that's a lot of textual variance. OK, let's, uh, let's take a break. I'm done. I don't have anything else to say. No, 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 no. This, no, I'm going to do a Paul Harvey on you. Some of you have heard that name and tell you the rest of the story. The reason that we have a lot of variants is because we have a lot of manuscripts. If we had one manuscript, it wouldn't disagree with itself at all. As soon as you have two manuscripts, you've got differences. Three, you add more differences and more and more and more. Let me go back 
300 years ago to John Mill's Novum Testamentum Graeca. Here was a man who was uh, at Oxford University who spent his entire adult career writing one book, this book, the Greek New Testament. And what he did was he looked at as many Greek manuscripts as he could find to, uh, it's called collating, compare them right down to the very details of the letters, one with another. And then he put into the footnotes of his Greek New Testament every single variation that he could find among these 99 Greek New Testament manuscripts. Then he looked at church fathers' writings and ancient translations, and he found altogether approximately 30,000 textual variants. That's 300 years ago with 99 manuscripts. Now, John Mill was attacked immediately because of this work. He was attacked by Protestants who said, this is the work of the devil. Not all Protestants said that, but some did. And they said, this is the work of the devil. We already have our, our exact text, which is the Greek text that stands behind the King James Bible. That's the Greek New Testament. And uh, so they, they rejected what Mill had to say. Catholics uh, scorned him as well. And they said, you know, you Protestants, you have a paper pope. And that paper pope has footnotes. He has marginal readings. How do we know what that pope originally said? Our pope, at least, speaks ex cathedra, and we know what he's talking about. Well, John Mill never defended himself. Not one word to anybody. And the reason is he died two weeks after this thing was published. Now, I think he timed that perfectly. When I write my magnum opus, I want to die two weeks later so I can avoid all the critics. It's just, uh, it, it'll make my life so much easier and my wife's life so much easier. But there was a man who defended him in 1713. I'll show you first a page from the Apocalypse, the book of Revelation. Here's the text of Revelation. And then in much smaller font, below the yellow line, you see these, uh, these footnotes of various differences in the wording uh, in the text of Revelation. And that's just one page where it has uh, fewer footnotes, fewer differences than in other uh, parts of the New Testament. Well, Richard Bentley, six years later, wrote a book called Remarks Upon a Discourse of Free Thinking. And what he had to say in here is really profound and is valuable for us to this day. Richard Bentley, by the way, is universally acknowledged as light years ahead of his time in textual studies. Both liberal and conservative scholars think he was absolutely brilliant and, and way ahead of, uh, he was about 150 years ahead of where others were uh, thinking at that time. And he said, if there had been but one manuscript of the Greek Testament at the restoration of learning about two centuries ago, he's talking about, I'm sorry, uh, he's talking about the publication of the first Greek New Testament by a fellow named Erasmus, which came out actually in this month, 500 years ago, March 1516. It's a, it's a great year. 20 months later, almost exactly to the day, 20 months later, Martin Luther nails 95 theses to the door of the Wittenberg Church, and he could only have done so if Erasmus's Greek New Testament were in his hands. That's how he discovered the gospel. And so what Richard Bentley is saying is if there had been but one manuscript of the Greek Testament at the restoration of learning about two centuries ago, then we would have had no various readings at all. And would the text be in a better condition now then than it is now that we have 30,000 variant readings? It's good, therefore, to have more anchors than one, and another manuscript to join the first would give more authority as well as security. Bentley was on to something. He was saying, let's not be afraid of doing serious historical research. We should never be afraid to pursue the truth. Let's look at the data and see what it has to say, and we may be able to reconstruct a better New Testament than the one that we had based our work on so far. Well, today we have a few more than 99 Greek New Testament manuscripts, quite a few more. Here's what the latest number is. 5,839 Greek New Testament manuscripts from the second century all the way up to a little bit past the time of the printing press where they were not based on printed uh, uh, texts. But uh, these manuscripts, I'll, I'll give you a little more stats on this in a minute. These manuscripts, uh, some of them can be as small as tiny fragments, the size of a, a, a credit card. Others can be the entire New Testament. But the average Greek New Testament manuscript is more than 450 pages long. That's the average. We have over 2.6 million pages of manuscripts to photograph, so that's great job security for me. 
Now, let me give you a correction. Because let, let's say you, you're in Starbucks and uh, you're arguing with your uh, non-Christian friend and um, your friend says, you know, there's 5,839 manuscripts of the Greek New Testament. You say, no, 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 let me correct you. Here, I'm going to give you the updated stats. I'm sure they, they would know that information. But you're going to say there's 5,859 as of this month. I got back from Greece uh, nine days ago, spending uh, two weeks there. That was my 10th trip to Athens in the last year and discovered uh, three manuscripts in those two weeks that I was there this, this month. That brought to the total of manuscripts that we have discovered in Athens in the last year, 20. 20 Greek New Testament manuscripts that are not yet known to New Testament scholars, but they will be known in, in due time. 20 New Testament manuscripts we've discovered in the last year. It's pretty exciting. Well, the New Testament was also translated into other ancient languages, such as Latin, starting in the second century. We have more than 10,000 copies of the New Testament in Latin alone. That's because Latin became the lingua franca of Western Europe, and as Latin swept across Europe and Greek shrunk in its influence, we started to get more and more churches that spoke Latin instead of Greek. But the New Testament was also translated into other ancient languages, like Coptic, which is Egyptian hieroglyphics put into Greek letters, or Syriac, or uh, Old Church Slavonic, Armenian, Arabic, uh, Hebrew even, and Georgian, Gothic. There's all sorts of languages. And the best estimates we have on those is that the other ancient versions or translations, we have somewhere between 5,000 and 10,000 manuscripts. Now, these numbers, except for the first two, because these are updated, are what I have used when I have debated skeptics on this, and they're indisputable. These are actually conservative numbers. It's higher than this, most likely, but I'm trying to be conservative. So we have between 20 and 25,000 manuscripts, 20 and 26,000 almost, um, of the New Testament in Greek and other ancient languages. That's a lot of manuscripts. Now, what if I had a magic wand and could wipe all those manuscripts out in one fell swoop? we would still not be left without a witness. And that's because of people known as the church fathers or patristic writers. They wrote homilies, sermons, theological treatises, commentaries, apologetics works, and they started in the late first century. That's when we have our earliest church fathers all the way up through the 13th century. These men did not have the gift of brevity. They wrote and they wrote and they wrote. And one of the great things they did is they talked about Paul says this in this place, and they'll give an exact word, then expound what Paul means by that word. That helps us to date that wording in that location, in that place, because of what that church father has to say. This is hugely valuable information for us. If we wiped out all of these manuscripts, we would be able to reconstruct virtually the entire New Testament many, many times over on the basis of the writings of the church fathers alone. We have now over one million quotations by the church fathers of the New Testament. When you have 7,941 verses, I think, is what we actually have in the New Testament, over a million quotations, that's, that's quite a bit of material. So we have an embarrassment of riches. Well, how do you know that? Let's compare it to some classical texts. But before I do that, I want to give you a quick aside on the Center for the Study of New Testament Manuscripts. That's, that's a big mouthful. Uh, here's a way you can remember this, because we have a website that you can go to and see these images of manuscripts. It's csntm.org. You, you all have read C.S. Lewis, so you know the first two letters, C.S. And you've probably all seen The Wizard of Oz. Antium, Antium. C.S., Antium. There you go. You won't forget it. It's stupid, but you won't forget it, right? That's how I taught you Greek, right, Charles? Everything was stupid, especially anything I had to say. Okay, well, what is CSNTM? It's a nonprofit institute that uh, I founded uh, 14 years ago based in Plano, and we have two primary objectives. First, to digitally preserve all Greek New Testament manuscripts. And secondly, to provide these images free for all, free for all time, in order to help determine the exact wording of the original New Testament. Some of the accomplishments of CSNTM to date, that we've digitized over 350,000 pages of New Testament manuscripts and, and counting. We're the world's leader. In fact, it's over 400,000 now, I believe. 
we've discovered more than 90 New Testament manuscripts. That's more than all the rest of the institutes and individuals in the world combined have discovered in the last 14 years. It's really impressive, uh, especially because we're such a tiny organization. Seven employees, three full-time, four part-time. For a long time, CSNTM existed in my mind and in my living room, much to my wife's torment. And I've mentored dozens of interns to work with manuscripts. Many of them are now getting doctorates uh, all over the world. So it's very, very exciting to see. Well, our current project is at the National Library of Greece in Athens. This is the inside of the library. We're digitizing over 300 New Testament manuscripts, 150,000 images. They contacted us and said, we're really excited about the possibility of you coming and digitizing our manuscripts. We said, oh, we'd love to do it. Give us some time to raise the money because it's about $850,000 we have to raise. Uh, all images will be available online for free and the work began in January last year and it will conclude in August of this year. We usually have seven or eight people in Greece working for three months at a time. Let me just show you some example photographs of uh, these manuscripts. Some of them are absolutely gorgeous. This is not the kind of thing you get in printed books. It's, it's stunning, the quality of what they could produce. Uh, here's actual gold lettering, uh, and uh, they, they love to show the, uh, the birds and all the icons and, and the, 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 the gold and what's called lapis lazuli, that blue, which is actually more expensive than gold, comes from a stone that they had to grind up. It's just, just phenomenal. And they did this, get this. These scribes did this, and the artists did this to, to add all the ornate artwork so that people would get their eye attracted to the text and would memorize it. Quite a different world from what we live in today. Here's, as I mentioned earlier on the very first slide, the oldest manuscript of Paul's letters in the world. And along with photographing the manuscripts in Athens, we are publishing or republishing uh, the Chester Beatty papyri. These are housed in, in Dublin, Ireland, and at the University of Michigan. And we have gotten permission from both institutes where we've photographed the manuscripts to get these published in a handsome three-volume uh, work. This is the end of Ephesians and beginning of Galatians. It's the only manuscript in the world, as far as I know, that has Ephesians before Galatians, which is the proper order. And we think, well, how'd this guy get it wrong? Well, he was the first. Maybe he got it right and everybody else got it wrong. So here's a, a close-up of that. And what we're doing with our photographs is you can now read text on lines that was simply not visible before. We are literally finding hundreds of letters that were not visible before with these photographs. It's, it's really stunning. We shoot with a black background and a white background. We now use 50 megapixel cameras. Each image is uh, almost 300 megabytes. It's a... Uh, it's, it's a really a storage problem. <laughs> okay, now back to the number of New Testament manuscripts. That was just a little side note on CSNTM. If you want to ask more about that during the q and I'll be happy to field questions. Let's compare the New Testament to the average classical work. The average classical Greek writer has less than 15 copies of his works still in existence. Stack them up, they're four feet high. Let's get a visual representation of that. So it'd be like a podium, like like this podium right here. What do we compare uh, to the podium that's on the New Testament side? Well, I gave that a lot of thought. And I found something that would be representative of the New Testament if you were to stack those manuscripts up. The Empire State Building. Now, this is not to scale. I hope you realize that. <laughs> the next slide will show it to scale. And this was really hard to pull off. Here's that podium. Okay, at the end of the area, you all, you all got your eye focused there. See that little dot? That's four feet high. That's the podium. That's the Empire State Building, 1,454 feet tall. I got a lot of extra room here. What am I going to do with that? Well, the New Testament is not just one Empire State Building tall. It's four and a half. It's more than 6,600 feet tall of manuscripts. That's a mile and a quarter compared to four feet. I'd say that's an embarrassment of riches, isn't it? And that's not counting the church father's one million plus quotations. I have no idea how to quantify that in terms of manuscripts. This is just those ancient manuscripts. So I'm comparing oranges with oranges. 
This is an astounding amount of evidence. And uh, let me just illustrate this another way in terms of the dates and the, the number of copies. I picked some Greco-Roman historians and biographers, and these are well-known historians and biographers. Plenty of the elder first century writer were waiting 700 years before we get a single copy of Pliny's writings. However, he was very, very popular, and so we have 200 copies. 200 copies compared to 20 to 25,000 for the New Testament. Plutarch, we're waiting 800 years before we get a single copy of Plutarch's writings. Josephus, we're waiting 800 years and we have 26 copies of his writings. Josephus was the first century Jewish historian who died in about AD 100 and he wrote about John the Baptist, this guy named James, who was also the brother of this fellow named Jesus that he wrote about. That's why we have that many copies of Josephus, because Christians copied his text, 26 copies. Polybius, we're waiting 1,200 years before we get a single copy of Polybius. Pausanias, who did the, the uh, geography of Greece, 1,400 years before we get a single shred of anything by, by Pausanias. And we don't have very much. We have huge gaps in his writings. Then Herodotus, who was one of the two great historians in the 5th century BC. His histories, he, he really was the father of historiography, how to write history. Uh, we, we are convinced that Luke probably followed Herodotus in large measure in how he wrote his uh, Gospel of Luke and his book of Acts. He wanted to make it historical, really reliable. We are waiting 1,500 years before we get anything larger than a few scraps of papyrus by Herodotus. 1,500 years. And then there's Xenophon's Hellenica. We're waiting 1,800 years before we get more than just a few scraps of papyrus. Now, if that were the case with the New Testament, and remember this argument. Use it with your friends at Starbucks and at work. Is there a Starbucks up here? Okay, so it's, it's, you know what a Starbucks is. I, I, you know, I'm really out in the hicks here. I, this, is a, this is a long drive for me, so I feel like I drove all the way to Oklahoma tonight. I like Oklahomans. I really, are there any Oklahomans here? Okay, I'll tell my jokes more slowly. Okay. <laughs> All right, Xenophon's Hellenica, 1,800 years before we get anything larger than a few scraps of papyrus. If the New Testament were in that shape, our earliest substantial manuscripts would have been written about the time that the Wright brothers invented the airplane. Do you think the skeptics would have a field day then? Yeah, they would. And yet... Scholars of Xenophon say, this is what we've got. This is what we have to deal with. And it's pretty accurate. We think we can reconstruct Xenophon's Hellenica pretty accurately, not as accurately as we'd like. We don't have nearly the materials that New Testament scholars uh, uh, have, but we do have some materials. And we're waiting a long time, but still, we can do a pretty accurate job. That skepticism against the New Testament doesn't go in other directions. It's only against the New Testament, not against these other classical authors. Okay, well, I talked about the date of some of these manuscripts, and let me talk to you about the date of New Testament manuscripts, too. And I've got a couple slides here that will illustrate this for you. First is, I want to talk to you about the discovery of P-52. This was not an airplane that was developed after the P-51 Mustang in World War II. This means papyrus number 52. And before I tell you about the discovery of this manuscript, let me tell you about something that happened 90 years earlier in the year 1844. There was a scholar by the name of F.C. Bauer, Ferdinand Christian Bauer, a German scholar who had studied under Professor Hegel at the University of Tübingen in uh, southern Germany. Hegel invented that famous doctrine called Hegelian dialectic, which you may not know by that name, but you probably know thesis, antithesis, synthesis. You all know that, right? That's Hegelian dialectic. Back in the 1700s is when he developed this. Now, you take that, for example, if some of you have uh, a teenage boy. Thesis. The boy says, uh, or the father says, you are not going to wear a tattoo. You're not going to put a tattoo on your body. Antithesis. Yes, I am. Synthesis. He's got a tattoo. So sometimes the synthesis ends up in that direction. What Bauer did is he applied Hegelian dialectic to the New Testament. And on the basis of this philosophical construct, he essentially said, 
The Gospel of John, which I think most of us kind of like, right? It's inspired. It's, 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 a, it's, it's great, a great read. It's, it's even historical, I would think, most of us would think. Bauer said the Gospel of John cannot have been written any earlier than A.D. 160. And he thought the date of it was probably closer to 170. His views took off like wildfire all over Europe. And for the next 90 years, there was a massive amount of skepticism about the Gospel of John. It can't possibly have any historically reliable material. Until 1934, when a young scholar, a doctoral graduate by the name of C.H. Roberts, Colin H. Roberts, was studying at the Manchester University in central England. He had been bequeathed a, a, a shoebox full of papyrus scraps that had been unearthed in Egypt in 1920. And uh, when I say bequeathed, his predecessor, who had looked at a number of manuscripts, finally retired, and so uh, Roberts got these manuscripts to look at. And he pulls out a fragment in one of these, uh, th th that's in this box, and here's a, a, a picture of it. And what he noticed was that the handwriting was, was very, very clear. It's actually easier to read papyrus than it is parchment, uh, which I won't discuss unless you ask a question about that later. But what really caught his eye was that there was writing on this side and on the back side. Well, that's just not normal. What you get on Greek manuscripts is you get writing on one side. It goes with the fibers. The fibers go along this way of the papyri because they, they lay down these papyrus uh, uh, plant leaves. They, they, they uh, lay down the, the fibers and then they hammer some other uh, stalks behind them so it, it naturally glues to each other and they only write on the horizontal fibers. It's a lot harder to write on the vertical fibers. That's how they wrote scrolls. Well, C.H. Roberts later, 40 years later, became the scholar who would write the book on the birth of what's called the Codex. And the title of his book is The Birth of the Codex. A codex is not a scroll. It's a modern book form. A, book, a modern book form meaning that it's bound on one side, you have cut pages that you flip and you can actually see page numbers and you go on and it goes from one page to the other. Now, if you're under 30 years old, you may have never seen a codex. If you look, don't, do you all use hymnals here? No hymnals, okay. Well, then maybe, could you hold up your Bible for us, Charles? That's a codex, folks. That is a codex. We don't know who invented it. That's, that's fine thing. Um, but we know that the Christians were the first to popularize it. In the first five centuries A.D., 80% of all Christian manuscripts were written on a codex. Only 20% of non-Christian manuscripts were written on a codex. They were written on a scroll. By AD 500, the rest of the world basically caught up with Christianity and started to use the codex form where you could write on both sides, get twice as much material in, and our modern book form was born 1900 years ago. Now, Roberts, when he looked at this, he knew this fact. And he saw writing on both sides. He said, this must have been written on a codex. I bet this is a Christian text. And so he looked at it. He transcribed the text. He said, this is a Christian text. This side is John chapter 18, verses 31 through 33. The actual size of this leaf is about the size of a credit card, two and a half by three and a half inches. Then the back side was John 18, same chapter, verses 37 and 38. He actually could figure out the size of each page of this manuscript, how many leaves it had. He was able to do all sorts of things with it. But he sent this, sent photographs of this manuscript to the three leading papyrologist scholars, uh, papyrus scholars in Europe at the time. And he said, please give me your best estimate on the date of this. I'm kind of new at this field. Each one of them wrote back to him independently of the other guy. This manuscript cannot be dated any later than A.D. 150 and should be dated as early as 100. All three of them thought that the earlier date was more likely. A fourth scholar, a German, demurred, and he said, no, I think it may have been written in the 90s. That is the date today that most scholars think John's gospel was written, in the 90s. So I grew up in Southern California, and I, I don't know about you, I'm sure your education was just as good as, as mine because I have four Texans and uh, four sons who all got educations here, great educations, I think, frankly, in a lot of ways better than what I got. Um, but uh, I was taught that, generally speaking, uh, 
a manuscript, a, a copy of a manuscript is not written before the original of that manuscript. <laughs> Isn't that kind of what you're taught here too? This sent two tons of German scholarship to the flames. One scrap of papyrus destroyed Bauer's hypothesis. One tiny scrap of papyrus. And so it reminds me of this little ditty. An ounce of evidence is worth a pound of presumption. Or in this case, less than an ounce of evidence is worth two tons of presumption. The Greek New Testament manuscripts, if we think about them century by century or cumulatively, and I'm just talking about the Greek, Here's how many we have in the second century, from 100 to 200, as many as a dozen manuscripts. And then for the rest of the centuries, just through AD 1000, we have almost 1,000 manuscripts by that time. The next century, we virtually double this. We have over 1,800 manuscripts altogether. Now, that is an astounding amount of manuscripts. There are four times more New Testament manuscripts within the first 200 years than the average Greco-Roman author has in 2,000 years. Within 900 years of the New Testament's completion, we have almost 1,000 manuscripts in Greek alone. Within 900 years of the average classical author's writings, there are zero manuscripts. It's a huge difference, isn't it? Has the Bible been translated and retranslated so many times that we don't know what it originally said? Well, here's another way to look at the question. When the King James Bible was done in 1611, it was based essentially on seven Greek New Testament manuscripts, the oldest of which came from the 11th century. Today, 400 years later, we have nearly a thousand times as many manuscripts, some of which go back nearly a thousand times earlier than the ones that the King James translators used. So has the Bible been translated and retranslated so many times we can't tell what it originally said? As time goes on, we're actually getting closer and closer to the original text. That's a remarkable fact. All right, I am not done with my lecture. That was just the first point, but that takes up 95% of my time. So don't worry, I'm not going to keep you in your seats too much longer. We'll get a break in a little bit. Question number two, what kinds of textual variations are there? We dealt with a number. You understand lots of data to think about. Uh, but uh, here's a way to think about uh, the nature of these variants. All of them can be grouped in terms of whether they are meaningful or viable. A meaningful textual variant means it actually changes the meaning of the text to some degree. A viable mean, uh, one means it has a sufficient pedigree to potentially represent the wording of the original. And there are four groups of textual variants then. Neither meaningful nor viable, viable but not meaningful, meaningful but not viable. And the only one that really is of interest to anybody is meaningful and viable. I'm going to explain to you how many of those we have. We have hundreds of thousands of textual variants, but how many of them are meaningful and viable? How many of them actually affect the meaning of the text? Do they affect any essential theology? And are they viable? Could they possibly go back to the original? Well, frankly, over 99% of all our textual variants, all these three other categories, make virtually no difference at all. Most of them can't even be translated. The most common textual variant is a spelling difference. We have these in the manuscripts, and scribes did not use dictionaries. They didn't know how to spell any bit. Sorry. There you go. That was a quick recovery, wasn't it? They didn't have dictionaries. There was no correct or incorrect way of spelling, but every time you see the word John in Greek, Ioannes, it's either with one N or with two. It depends on what the manuscripts are. That counts as a textual variant every time we see it in the New Testament. So here's a question for Greek geeks. How many ways are there to say John loves Mary in Greek? I asked myself that question very seriously three years ago when I was lecturing up in Oklahoma City, and I decided I'm going to write out all the ways you could say John loves Mary in Greek. Now, you'll see the relevance of this in just a minute. Items to consider. Word order differences. In Greek, it's a highly inflected language. You can have Mary loves John in that order, and a Greek would read this as John loves Mary because of the endings. Or loves Mary John. They'll still read it as John loves Mary. The article, the word the, occurs with proper names in Greek. We don't know why. Uh, so it could be the Mary loves the John, or the John loves the Mary, and, and you have that in, in uh, manuscripts. We're not sure why that is. 
I did my master's thesis on when the article does not occur in the Greek New Testament. I did my doctoral dissertation on when it does occur. These two works could cure the most hopeless insomniac. There are 20,000 of these buggers in the New Testament. It's the most common word. You teach students the word the in Greek, and they know now one-seventh of all the vocabulary they're all covering come across. It's not going to help them much, the, the, you know, it just doesn't do much for them. But we don't know why it occurs with proper names, but it does. I don't think there's ever been any cardinal doctrine, any minor doctrine ever based on that at all. Then there's differences in spellings, as I mentioned, the different uh, spellings for John and for Mary. So here's the eight ways you can say John loves Mary in Greek. You should be writing this down. It'll show up on the quiz. Oh, no, there's another eight ways and more. By the way, notice the first word there, agapa. Oh, you don't know that. Anyway, it's um, agape. It's uh, the same uh, root. I'm using the same verb all the way through here. There's 96 ways to say John loves Mary in Greek without changing the meaning at all. Now, with conjunctions that are often untranslated, there's a bunch of conjunctions that don't get translated, there's a lot more ways. So let me just go through these real quick. I hope you're, you've got a photographic memory because this will all be on the exam. 384 ways to say John loves Mary altogether. That's really not exactly true. After eight hours of doing this, I said, ah, that's, that's enough to kind of prove the point. I didn't finish the job. These are not all the ways you can say John loves Mary. It's probably over 500. The different verb for loves mushrooms the numbers to nearly 1,200. And yet it doesn't change the substantial meaning of the text. Now, Bart Ehrman says, we could go on nearly forever talking about specific places in which the texts of the New Testament came to be changed either accidentally or intentionally. The examples are not just in the hundreds, but in the thousands. Well, he's right, but he's not telling you the whole story. If we can say John loves Mary over a thousand times in Greek without substantially changing the meaning, the number of textual variants, the thousands, the tens of thousands, the hundreds of thousands for, uh, for the New Testament is absolutely meaningless. What actually counts is the nature of the variants. And frankly, you could have tens of millions of textual variants without ever even affecting translation. That's how many there could possibly be. If you can have a three-word English sentence, John loves Mary, based on uh, almost 1,200 different ways to write that in Greek, think of how many you could have for a 140,000-word text. How many possibilities could we possibly have? And Ehrman knows this. It's not just the number of variants. We could go on talk forever about these thousands of variants, but we'd just be as, uh, well, you'd, you'd, uh, your insomnia would be as cured by talking about that as reading my thesis and dissertation. The smallest group of variants that are both meaningful and viable, uh, and they are less than one-fifth of 1% 1 of all textual variants fit this group, are those that are the meaningful and viable category. Here's an actual representation of it. That's one five hundredth of that block. I'm going to give you four illustrations, but two of them, for the sake of time, uh, I won't be able to uh, discuss, but maybe we can pick this up during the Q&A. First illustration, I'll talk about the first two, and then the last two, I'll just put them up here, but we'll uh, pass on those. Mark chapter 9, verse 29. The disciples had just been trying to exercise some demons. They were unsuccessful. They came to Jesus. And he said to them, this kind can only be cast out by prayer and fasting. Well, I put and fasting in brackets, and that's because those words are not found in the oldest manuscripts or the best manuscripts, but are found in the majority of the later manuscripts. Do certain kinds of demons need to be fasted over as well as prayed over before they can be kicked out, cast out? Well, most scholars would say, you know, the evidence for and fasting is not that strong. We think that the sentence ended with prayer. And as you can see by, by looking at me, I, I agree with a shorter reading. But we won't dwell on that point. Um, but if you are involved in exorcisms, you might want to hedge your bet and pray and fast before you do this kind of thing. <laughs> Let's take a more familiar passage. Revelation 13, 18. Everybody on the streets... Anybody knows this. What's the number of the beast? Oh, 666. We all know that. 
Let the one who has insight calculate the beast's number, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. Really? Not all the manuscripts say that. There was one discovered in 1844 that was actually a text buried under another text that was written on top of it about 800 years later. A scribe came along, saw this parchment, a very old parchment text, and he scraped off the words. And then he wrote another text on top of it 800 years later. And it was in 1843 and 1844 that a scholar, a German scholar, came to the National Library of Paris and he spent two years reading that under text. It was a nearly impossible text task and he was able to decipher 99% of it. And at Revelation 13, 18, it said the number of the beast was 616. Now, in 2009, I had the opportunity to go to the National Library of Paris and look at this very same manuscript and read this very same text, and sure enough, that scholar was right. It says 616. That manuscript is now one of our two most important New Testament manuscripts for the book of Revelation. It was the only one that had 616, though, until 1998, when another manuscript, the oldest manuscript for this chapter, was discovered. It's 26 fragments about the size of postage stamps spread out over nine chapters in Revelation. And at this very place, it says the number of the beast is 616. It was discovered at the Ashmolean Museum of Oxford University. They have more than half a million papyrus fragments, most of which still need to be deciphered. And I had the opportunity, four years after this was discovered, to go to the Ashmolean, and I uh, said, uh, can I take a look at uh, this papyrus? And they uh, showed it to me. I looked at it under a magnifying glass and a microscope, and sure enough, it said 616. No erasures, no changes. But that's just two manuscripts. So... Is the number of the beast 666 or 616? The oldest manuscript says 616. One of the most important manuscripts says 616. But most scholars today still are inclined to think, you know, 666, that's the number of the beast. 616, that's, that's the neighbor of the beast. He lives a few doors down. <laughs> so I'm not sure. I don't know. I can't say in all respects exactly. I know that I have the Word of God in my hands if I have 666 in there and the original was 616 or vice versa. It depends what day it is, whether I think it's 616 or 666. It's a really difficult problem to solve. The two longest disputed passages in the New Testament that we will not discuss, uh, we can do this during Q&A if you'd like to pick them up, the long ending of Mark's Gospel about picking up snakes and uh, drinking poison and speaking in tongues and the story of the woman caught in adultery in John's Gospel. Um, I'll just kind of, I'll just have to go through this because we don't have the time for this. But um, here we see some snake handlers who maybe their faith wasn't as strong as it could have been. Um, and here's another guy whose faith apparently was not strong at all. <laughs> but uh, I don't think that long ending is authentic. But the story of the woman caught in adultery is my favorite passage that's not in the Bible. And a distinction needs to be made between what is canonical and what is historical. And I think the story may well be true historically, even if John did not write it. But if it's not part of the New Testament, what do we lose? Is this the only passage we have that speaks of Jesus forgiving somebody? If that's the only passage you know, you need to read your Gospels again. So we're not going to get into the arguments on this one. Uh, I'll just leave, say that faith must be based on evidence, not emotions. Question number three, what theological beliefs depend on textually suspect passages? And we come back to the Da Vinci Code with Sir Lee Teabing. And he says to Sophie in his home in France, my dear, Teabing declared, until that moment in history, Jesus was viewed by his followers as a mortal prophet, a great and powerful man, but a man nonetheless, a mortal. He's talking about A.D. 325 when Emperor Constantine, the first Christian emperor, convened the Council of Nicaea, and then he left, and then he came back at the end of this thing. But basically what Dan Brown and Sir Lee Teabing and the, and the book that uh, Brown basically borrowed very heavily from, some say plagiarized, they said that Emperor Constantine invented the deity of Christ. M. M. Al Azami seems to be saying the same thing, that until A.D. 325, we don't have evidence for the deity of Christ anywhere in Christianity. Remember how I told you an ounce of evidence is worth a pound of presumption? Here's another ounce of evidence. This is the oldest manuscript of John chapter 1. In fact, it has almost all of John in it. 
This is P66 written between 175 and 200. And here it is at John 1.1 1, 1, for the next several verses. It speaks about something in a verse that most of us would be familiar with. And uh, this verse might actually say it differently because it's 125 years older than uh, Emperor Constantine. Read along with me if you would in verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Have you heard that before? Of course. Of course you have. Because every manuscript, no matter the language that it's in, says virtually the same thing. It doesn't matter the date or the language. They all say unequivocally that Jesus Christ is called God in John 1.1. And the same can be said for the major passages that affirm his deity, his virgin birth, his sinlessness, his death on a cross, his bodily resurrection, and his second coming. And we have no verses that contradict these things in any of the manuscripts. So question four, has the essence of the Christian faith been corrupted by the scribes? I come back to Bart Ehrman, and in his book, Misquoting Jesus, after his hardback had come out and there were 300,000 copies sold within just a few months, the publishers apparently wanted to keep the sales going, and so they came out with a paperback version. And they decided to ask Bart some questions in an appendix to this version. And so they asked him, on page 252 in the appendix, and I'm giving you this because it's important for you to have the actual page. Why do you believe these core tenets of Christian orthodoxy to be in jeopardy based on the scribal errors you discovered in the biblical manuscripts? Remember I told you Bart Ehrman is an agnostic, but he also studied under Dr. Bruce Metzger, an evangelical, and he had uh, a moment of profound integrity in his response to this question. He said, I don't really disagree with Professor Metzger. In fact, what I would say is the following. Essential Christian beliefs are not affected by textual variants in the manuscript tradition of the New Testament. Isn't that amazing? Tens of thousands of young people who were raised in the church, go off to college, have abandoned the faith, because of the writings of Bart Ehrman and other skeptics. But if they were able to read all the way through the book and see this statement, maybe they'd realize that he isn't exactly saying what they thought he was saying. So let me conclude with an unnatural segue, and we've gone just a little bit over time, and then we'll take a, a, a what, about a 10-minute break, I guess, Charles? So you want me to announce that when I'm done then? Okay. A polar bear attacks a man in Canada and bystanders do nothing. The media did not even report this incident. Now, I want you all to have in your mind an image of what this must look like, because I'm going to show you some photographs of this polar bear attacking this man. Have in mind what this gruesome ordeal must be all about. And I want you to think, okay, this is when someone says there's half a million texture variants among the New Testament manuscripts. You have a picture, a mental picture of this? Okay, if you just had dinner before tonight, you might want to close your eyes. The rest of you can look. Here we go. <laughs> Did I describe this accurately? Oh, you don't know if it's Canada or not, but here's a polar bear attacking a man. And he may well have loosened one of the uh, threads in his 501 blues. But he didn't hurt the guy. When you think half a million texture variants, have this picture indelibly embedded in your mind. What does it really affect? Nothing that is of essential cardinal belief for us. No essential doctrine is jeopardized by any of these viable variants, and even Bart Ehrman can agree with me on that. Let's take a break for 10 minutes, shall we? Come back at 825.